Today, refugiums, what are we leaving on the table? These are the 10 questions you didn't know to ask until just now. This is Beers TV Answers. If you have a refugium or considering one, these are the questions that the seasoned pros are asking and the answers. Question number one is a purple grow light that much better? And the answer is no. It's just more cost effective. You're not wasting money on uh, lights or LEDs that the plant can't use, in which case purple's not necessarily better, it's just less wasteful. That's why you see a lot of the horticulture or grow lights out there have that kind of purple hue or spectrum to them. They're just not including LEDs that visually would make it look white or more balanced to the eye. They're focused on growth and getting the most growth for the dollar. So purple not necessarily going to grow it better. It's just often going to be more cost effective. At question number two, is there any benefit to the white or full spectrum or often referred to as freshwater lights out there? And for refugiums, the answer is actually yes. Yeah, it's full, full spectrum light allows you to see under your stand. A lot of times it's just so dark under there. And if I go to harvest my Kato, I can see, you know, if there's if bristle worms or if I'm about to grab something I don't want to. And also if you have like display algaes that you might want to enjoy with a full spectrum light, you can see them better with all those whites, yellows, and greens. Yeah, so if you want the plant to actually look green, it needs to be full spectrum and include uh, some green spectrum <laughs> in there. Uh, and so if you only care about growth, the purple is probably the right move. Uh, but if I open up my stand, one of the benefits of the white lights is I can actually can see everything in there. It kind of serves a dual purpose. Allows me to see what my skimmer is doing and there's a nice bright light down there. Mm -hmm. Also, what it will do is uh, I can't really see the cyano in the purple light. Yeah. So if I'm growing tons of cyano or any kind of pest all over that uh, catomorpha, man, is it a lot, lot easier to see the performance and the health of the catomorpha using that freshwater light. Now you are paying a little bit for those LEDs that don't necessarily grow catomorpha faster, but the benefit is you can see what's going on. Question number three is spinning the Kato worth the effort? And if you have deep pockets and you're handy at DIY, and you're trying to figure out how to do this, uh, then the answer is yes. Yeah, so spinning it will have some benefits, meaning that if you get the little ball of Kato to turn around like the Death Star, <laughs> uh, it will expose the light to all of it around it. It will expose it to more nutrients. It will have more flow and it will almost certainly grow better. Uh, and you also won't collect all that detritus on the bottom. Mm. So, you know, this mesh of Catomorpha tends to collect all of this detritus and become basically like a filter sock in the tank. If it's turning around like the Death Star here, you can actually siphon out the bottom. It doesn't tend to collect in it in the same manner. However, the big question is how do you get that to do that? Yeah. I've seen people DIY like a rotisserie, you know, skewer it and spin it. Can be there, difficult. Is, there is no sump out there that does that by default. Mm. Uh, you can also do it with flow. It generally doesn't work with one little teeny pump. You have to use something like a gyre that really gets it rotating. So now I'm into it for a couple hundred dollar pump uh, to help benefit that. But if you do have the couple hundred bucks for it, I can put a gyre on the bottom, get this thing to spin like the Death Star. I will keep all the detritus suspended for the rest of filtration to uh, get rid of it. And they'll have much healthier catomorpha as well. All right, number four, the big question, can you stop this catomorpho from becoming the big detritus trap? Yeah, absolutely you can. And the first step would be filter socks. So catching those particulates before it goes into your refugium. In the 160, we cut out the filter socks, so this wasn't possible. So it did turn into a detritus trap, but you can if you put some filter socks in front of it. Also having an open bottom is another thing we learned on the 160. Letting it grow all the way down to the bottom of the sump just leaves a space for all of this detritus to build up and hard for you to get to and siphon out. Uh, you can also do the flow thing with the gyre on the bottom to keep the stuff suspended. Or, you know, something that uh, we get the question of a, a lot is where do you put your skimmer before or after the refugium? Putting it before allows the skimmer the chance to pull some of that out. 
Yeah, so it's all about your pre-filtration. Filter socks will take some of the detritus out so it doesn't get trapped in there. Keeping uh, the uh, pump on the bottom of the uh, refugium, even if it isn't spinning, it just kind of keeps it suspended if you keep some air around it. Instead of having it six inches deep or eight inches deep of uh, catamorpha, you probably only need like four inches as the part that's getting a, a lot of light. Mm -hmm. There are ways to make sure that you uh, can keep the detritus out of it and in fact, you can literally grab it and just put it into a five gallon bucket and rinse a lot of it mm. out. We do that question about the skimmer a lot. I don't know if it matters like the most, but if I had an option, I think I'd put the skimmer first to suck out a lot of the particulates and organics in the water before it hits the catamorpha. Question number five, how do I measure in real time the performance of my refugium, a tuning and par, and if there's an issue going on? So most people would think you're going to measure nitrate and phosphate. Well, that's kind of like the trailing end. You won't <laughs> know that things are going wrong for quite a long time. Yeah. The best way to actually measure the performance of your refugium is pH. Uh, meaning we've had people turn off by accident the, the light or it gets unplugged mm -hmm. or whatever. And you wouldn't really know because the light's on at night. Uh, <laughs> but we do know because the pH alarm goes off. And in fact, pH is also a really good performance of how much nutrients it's sucking up. Mm. Because if we crank the lights up and the uh, uh, ketomorpha or any other macroalgae you're using likes it, it will actually start sucking up carbon dioxide faster. And while it's sucking up the carbon dioxide, it's sucking up more nitrate and phosphate out of the tank. So any changes you do to the refugium or issues that might pop up will show itself in the pH. So if you're wondering how this works, look to pH and the trends from increasing or decreasing either the photo period or even the intensity or whether or not it's even on to know how well your refugium's working. All right, number six, if pH is the best real-time measurement of how your refugium is operating and reacting to flow or lighting changes, what is the best way to actually measure that? Because most of us aren't going to manually graph that. Yeah, I'm not going to wake up multiple times a night to measure pH and then uh, adjust my lights. In which case, starting with an acclimation mode on your light, a lot of these LEDs, the freshwater ones, you can put these things in acclimation mode and then monitor your pH specifically on like an apex graph. Because again, I'm not getting up multiple times a day to check pH but you can watch the trends and as the acclimation mode starts to increase par, you can watch the pH increase. And when that thing starts tipping and stop increasing the pH, you know you've hit your point. Yeah, so not only are you monitoring how well you're soaking up nitrate and phosphate, because it's increasing your pH, you're actually monitoring how fast your corals are growing as well. There's <laughs> another episode on that you should check out. But really, that graph on the apex is actually going to show you how well this performs and give it to you in data points. You can actually trash the, watch the trends and follow and know for sure how this is working. And better yet, when it's not performing, send you an alarm. Question number seven is a big one. Is that scrubber as good as a refugium? And the answer is absolutely. Yeah. It is a refugium of sorts. It's kind of like a remote refugium that grows hair algae on this sheet with the lights on both sides and you just scrape it off and throw it in the trash. Mm -hmm. Not all that different from growing catamorpha in a box like this, grabbing some and throwing the trash. It isn't whether one of these is better or than the other. Mm -hmm. Both of them will almost certainly make nutrients not an issue in your tank. The only real difference is, is which one fits your sump better? Yeah. Because if you have a big open refugium, maybe this is the best option. However, you don't have room for that, but you do have a location in your sump where you can install a scrubber along the side or even sitting on top of the sump. Well, you know what? The scrubber is probably the best solution for your specific install. Number eight. Along with the nitrate, phosphate, and CO2, the refugium and scrubber is actually sucking out a bunch of elements out of the water as well. Is that an issue? And the answer is almost certainly. If you have zooxanthellae, which is an algae, catamorpha, which is an algae, competing for the same trace elements as they grow, things like iron, molybdenum, uh, manganese, and things like that, then almost certainly it's an issue that you would have to address. Uh, the better that your catamorpha works, the more elements it's going to pull out. There are some test kits that we can do at home to kind of keep a pulse on these things. Uh, iron from Red Sea is one of them. If you're watching your iron deplete, almost certainly everything else is depleting, you know, in the same. Uh, ICP, though, give you a much clearer window into individual elements. I'd say that iron test kit 
a window into what's happening. Mm. The ICP, an actual report of, you can see all of it, yeah, what's happening. Yeah. And again, the better the refugium works, the bigger the issue it is. So how do you solve that? Well, one is actually knowing that it happens so you can do something about it. So that iron test kit's a good one. Just knowledge in general yeah. that it, it's likely to happen. But also, there are some intelligent ways to solve that. One of which is uh, in your two-part method, uh, being the Triton method, they actually account for this because it's based around using a refugium. So this is just a two-part with the Core 7 that is designed for refugium and elevates some of those things that are used up by the macroalgae. Another one is like Cato uh, Grow mm -hmm. from Brightwell. So if I use my iron test kit and I found out that things were low, I could probably dose that along with it and add some of those elements back in there. So all those things that are important to photosynthesis for the Catomorpha are missing, aren't starving out all of the zooxanthellae. Question number nine, how many pests can I get from adding in dirty Kato? I can tell you right now, I walk over to the 160 in the refugium and I can count a lot of them. I would say the answer is all of them. Yeah, uh, yeah, you sure. can add everything from this. And the problem is, is not only does this have a place for bristle worms and things that you eat to try this, mm -hmm. you may or may not want in your tank, all riddled throughout there. It's a place for flatworms. It's a place for aptasia. It gets light. So every photosynthetic pest can grow in this stuff. And so actually getting clean, clean catamorpha is really, really important because it won't add uh, any of those pests to your tank. They're just grabbing a you know, bucket of it out of your buddy's tank yep. or the fish store. Whatever's in their tanks is now in yours. That's actually one of the benefits of the scrubber here because the scrubber is just gonna grow hair, hair algae, mm -hmm. which kind of materializes out of your tank or thin air <laughs> almost. Uh, and it'll just grow uh, the uh, hair algae on the sheet. You don't have to go find clean catomorpha. And one of the benefits of using a scrubber is you don't have to worry about adding unintentional pests. Number 10. Should I turn on the refugium lighting the day I set up my system? Answer to that one is no. Now, turning it on before there's uh, ample enough nutrients to fuel the growth, we'll just set the Kato back. Uh, this is something that we learned in the ULM tank trials. We uh, started you know, a refugium almost day one, and it just kind of turned to mush because there was really nothing for it to fuel its growth. Yeah, I would say that you should at least have measurable nitrate and phosphate before you turn the light on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I wouldn't have it day one, but it doesn't have to be that much farther after. Okay, refugium questions uncovered and answered. What's next? Well, there's a BRSTV Investigates that we did that demonstrated just how well refugiums actually work. In fact, sometimes way too well. You can check that out here. And even better than that, the real question, does growing algae in the sump in the refugium prevent the algae from growing in the display? And the answer is, you'll have to find out.